Joining us now from her home in California is the director and producer of Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Fred story, Mary O'Leary. She's a seven-time Daytime Emmy Award winner. You can see a couple of those in the background there. Former producer of the daytime television dramas Guiding Light, Another World, One Life to Live, General Hospital, and Young and the Restless. After writing a letter to Jonathan Frid, and that's something I maybe want to talk about after a little bit, Mary, is um, Jonathan Frid was best known for being the Barnabas vampire from Dark Shadows. Uh, she became co-producer of his theatrical production company, Clunes Associate, and in this role, she prefer, uh, personally developed, nurtured, and marketed a series of one-man shows that Jonathan performed all across the country, universities, libraries, and performing arts centers. And I'd like to say, Mary, welcome to Try Fine. Congratulations on a very well done peek into a man, you know, the man that was Jonathan Fred. I, yeah, I know there's probably a lot of Dark Shadows fans here. And I think one of the main things that I got out of your documentary was that Jonathan was a lot more than an actor in a pair of fangs. So why was that important for a part of the story for you to tell? Hello, Greg. I'm so happy to have been invited to have this interview with you. Uh, yes, I wanted to let people see the Jonathan that I knew, uh, which was a man of, of great integrity. Um, he had respect and kindness for everybody he met. Um, and particularly in our times today, I think it's great to see a story where you look at an individual who always gave of himself, was always grateful, grateful to his parents, grateful to audiences, grateful to all the fans who over the years would come to see his shows, um, would uh, be, be thrilled to even come to me and recommend places where he might come to perform. So I wanted that was an important part when I was approached to do this documentary was to tell people about the man that I knew. I mentioned at the very beginning that you wrote a letter to Jonathan. I, I love that story because we, we have a, a similar story together. Uh, what was that all about? I had watched Dark Shadows when I was uh, preteen. I had loved it. I went off and then I went on with my life and first worked in the theater and then got into television. And one afternoon, uh, I discovered that Dark Shadows was in reruns on a New Jersey network public television station. I was living in Manhattan at the time. And they announced that they would be having Jonathan Fruit in the studio for a pledge drive. They used to have uh, public television stations would do pledge-a-thons and people would call in over the phone and pledge their $40 or whatever it was to the station. And uh, they said Jonathan Fruit would be their guest. And in fact, when I watched it, not only was he interviewed, he did two performance pieces. He read from uh, Richard III, a soliloquy, and then also Edgar Allan Poe's Telltale Heart. And I was so impressed. Um, and in the interview, he said, I'm working on a one-man show. So having come from a theater background, although at that time I was working in television on the soap opera Guiding Light, I decided to write to him and ask if he needed any help. I didn't know what capacity I might be assistant, assisting him in, but I was very, interested in, in the work because I'd love theater. I also had enjoyed watching this, not only him as Barnabas Collins, but this performance that he did on New Jersey Network. So um, much to my surprise, he he called me. Uh, I was sitting at home at, with a friend visiting from San Francisco and I was just saying to her, oh, there's reruns of Dark Shadows and maybe you'd like to watch that. And the phone rang, he said, hello, this is Jonathan Frid. <laughs> I was very surprised. <laughs> And he said, I was impressed with your letter. I'd like to set up a meeting to talk about my one-man show. And uh, I met him and we just talked about different ideas and eventually developed uh, not only one, but three one-man shows that he toured, as you said, across the country, universities, colleges, performing arts spaces, libraries, even sometimes private corporate events. So it was, um, it, it was a wonderful working relationship and um, I just had such fond memories of it, um, which I enjoyed sharing in the documentary. You know, a lot of people don't realize that um, the Dark Shadows mystique here, Dark Shadows was almost to go dark. It was it was failing in the ratings in the first season until they brought along the character of, of Barnabas. And, and uh, I always I always loved the idea that that Jonathan was 
not the, uh, the, the the vampire that was always, you know, lusting for blood, but the whole character of Barnabas uh, really I, is what saved the show. Was, was he aware of that? At the time he was being told that, he was getting mail. He couldn't believe that more and more mail kept coming every day for him. And when he went on publicity appearances and thousands of people were showing up, he, he was just confused. He didn't really understand how impactful his performance in the show was, how people were drawn to watch it because of his performance. Um, and when it ended, he thought, that's it. I go on to something else. But that show, unlike any other soap opera, went into syndication and has been seen ever since. So it went off in March of April of 1971. And it still can be seen today on many different places to be Amazon. It's shocking to realize that a show that is 55 years old is still available to be watched and holds up. Um, and I think that was a puzzlement. Uh, Jonathan never quite got it. I, when I'm asked, I say, I think combination of the writing of the classic Gothic horror romance tales, taking the writers who took the classics such as Frankenstein, Dracula, Turn of the Screw, Jekyll and Hyde, and put their characters into those stories, that makes it hold up. And the actors, because this soap opera was shot in New York, many of them had done Broadway, were stage actors, and they took it very seriously, uh, gave it their all. And I think their performances really still hold up. Now, of course, when we watch it today, you see plastic bats and uh, walls shaking, they were trying to do special effects, which had never been attempted in daytime television. Remember this 1966 to 71. Um, so I think that's why Jonathan was always puzzled by it. Um, but of course, it, it was something that he was happy to have been a part of. In the process of making this documentary, Mary, did you discover anything about Jonathan maybe that you didn't know? I mean, certainly some of his theater work. Uh, I knew he was at certain particular theater companies, but I didn't necessarily know all the particular roles he played. Um, I was, as seen in the documentary, I was thrilled to be able to locate in the UCLA archives him performing Shakespeare on stage, 1960, um, in Henry IV, part one. So it was thrilling to find that exists. I knew he had done that, but he had thought, uh, that it didn't exist anymore. Um, because unfortunately, quite a bit of, of television shows like the Dick Cavett, he did three interviews with Dick Cavett, none of the video exists because of the cost of tape in those days, they would tape over things. Even the Johnny Carson he was on, which was done in New York, they didn't keep those episodes. When Johnny moved, Carson moved to LA, then they started to save his episodes. Um, so in terms of discovery, it was discovering that, that was very exciting. I would say, um, the other thing would be how many charity appearances he made. I certainly was aware he did publicity for the show, but he really, a tremendous amount of his time was given to um, visiting children's hospitals, uh, just a wide range of charities that he was a part of. And, and that, I think the volume of that was a surprise to me. Uh, just for the audience's uh, benefit, uh, you have pulled together a lot of those performances, um, a lot of audio performances, and you have those available online on, on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Yes? Yes, I have taken some of his recordings. I, some are on video, but the video was so poor, but I was able, uh, with wonderful editor Robert Hoffman, to pull out the audio and uh, have a YouTube channel where you can listen to uh, over a dozen recordings of Jonathan doing short stories that he did in his one man shows. So out of all the people that you had the opportunity of interviewing for this project, Mary, it's always fun to see who people think is their uh, favorite of, of all those people. Do you have one? Can you pick one? That's a hard question. Um, I enjoyed so many of these people. Certainly David Selby from Dark Shadows was particularly special because he was very close to Jonathan and was just filled with so much emotion as he talked. But probably my favorite was Anthony Zerbe because he started talking about theater 
and gave such an incredible performance in this interview. I was so moved. I was in the moment and then also in the edit room, every time I watch it where he talks about the heart of an actor bringing to life the words of the playwright was such a powerful moment. So I have to say that was probably my most favorite interview. Jonathan was a very accomplished actor, you know, both both live theater and and television movies. And I'm wondering why did he spend so much time doing live one man shows around the country? He could have decided to do more television and film, but after Dark Shadows, um, which is touched on the documentary, there was a sort of typecasting that happened. And he, people who didn't even watch Dark Shadows were familiar with the photograph of the man with the fangs. And so he would go in, once he told the story of going in for a commercial, it was toothpaste, and they said, do your thing, Mr. Frid, as if he were going to be Bela Lugosi vampire. And he said, I don't have a thing. I played a character that was a vampire, but he was quite a multifaceted character. So I, I am here to audition, and what do you need for this particular uh, scene or copy? Uh, so he was frustrated, and he did two um, horror movies, and then was offered a third and said, enough. I just need to take a break. And uh, and when he decided to come back, which was around the time that I made, met him, um, he said, I love the stage. I want to return to the stage. Um, he didn't have any interest. In me. During the time I was with him, there were some offers that came in. And he said, no, I really want to do my one man show. I want to continue to tour across the country. Um, he just was completely, really most comfortable on the live stage. Uh, the television and film were not where he wanted to be. One of the aspects of this documentary, Mary, that I, I know is a little bit intriguing, and you and I have had a conversation a little bit about it, is that uh, you were approached to do this documentary as opposed to you having the uh, the impetus and the idea to be able to do this yourself. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, I was fortunate that MPI Media Group came to me and uh, asked me to do the documentary. I think for most filmmakers, the biggest challenge is getting the money to do your film, documentary, sci-fi, horror, whatever your script is. And that's the struggle. And in my case, I was given a budget, not a big budget, but a budget to do this. And I am very grateful that they came forward. I had not thought about doing it, but once offered, I was thrilled to jump into the project. What do you suppose, or what do you think was the most difficult part of putting this documentary together? When I was asked to do the documentary, and I had never done one before, and as you've mentioned, I primarily have been a producer of daytime soap operas, which has just been an incredible career. I really appreciate having had uh, the opportunity to work on five daytime soap operas, um, many of which are gone now. Uh, so my first thought was, I'm really excited to do this, but how do I do this? And I was given a very sage piece of advice from um, actress Laura Parker, who was seen in the documentary. Um, she has also written novels. And she said, when approaching a project, know the story you want to tell. So I thought about it and realized, as we said, Jonathan loved the stage. I wanted to explain who he was as a person and his love for performing on stage. And it started to, as I started to interview certain actors, it began to come together. I was blessed to have terrific videographers and sound. Um, and my editor, Michael Giglio, was terrific. Um, it was important, actually. I didn't realize it at the time. My editor was not familiar with Dark Shadows or Jonathan Frid. So he could have that objective eye. And I obviously was very, very close to material. So in the editing process, he would say, mm, I don't think this really is as clear as it could be. And maybe we could. So his suggestions were enormously helpful. And I'm very grateful to Michael um, and the terrific crews that I had along the way. I mean, because they also would help like the videographer with background and what would be good and not. And I, uh, you know, you, you don't do any project alone. You have a team and I greatly appreciate them. Um, and again, having not done this before, 
uh, it was great to have some some suggestions from people. And um, and then my executive producer Jim Pearson, who has done quite a few documentaries on musicians, famous singers, um, he said, "Well, you can write the questions." And uh, he suggested a few things. So uh, again, very appreciative to the people around me uh, that uh, uh, were able to give me some helpful advice. But I definitely knew I wanted to tell a story with heart um, because Jonathan had a big one. You can tell just by watching the show that you have uh, a, a definite love for the man and uh, and his career, and it really does show. I think as as you put the the whole documentary together, and I want to say thank you for you know taking some time to to talk with us about this, and thank you for uh, you know shining a light you know, on the man that was always kind of a mystery to a lot of people, because I think Jonathan came along at a time and then disappeared at a time just prior to, you know, the internet. And so there's been a lot of people out there who, uh, who maybe would like to know more about the guy. And, and I think you've done a very nice job of, of shining the light on, on that actor. Thank you so much. And if people want more information, there is a website, jonathanfrid.org. Uh, and it's been a pleasure talking with you, Greg. I'd like to thank the Tri-City International Film Festival for showing the documentary on their opening night of the film festival and um, also asking me to, to speak with you. Um, best wishes, everyone, uh, on the film festival. Um, I hope it's a big success. Thank you. And by the way, you can get your own T-shirt on, uh, on the uh, Jonathan Fred website that... Uh... You can show off your love of, of Jonathan Fred. Mary, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg.